I'm showing you what I listened to uh, growing up on the radio. Uh, don't forget Kingdom Kids. Uh, kids are more than welcome to uh, uh, go ahead and uh, head out for their study. Let me preface this sermon by saying this, and it's in your uh, outline. As you can plainly tell, I'm not a mom. And I, don't have, and I sure don't have enough gray hair to be a grandma. I do not fit into those categories. I will never fit into those categories, thankfully. I'm, I will be fine with being a father as I am already, and Lord willing, one of these days, to be a grandfather. That's perfectly fine. It's always an awkward place that the minister gets into on Mother's Day, and it's the awkward place because I'm trying to tell a mom or a grandmother, a grandmom, how to do that, <laughs> right? Well, there are a lot of times where I open my mouth at home and I try to tell my wife how to be a mom, and that doesn't work out so well. <laughs> so I'm going to stay in the father category. But there are some moral things that we can talk about when it comes to being a mom, when it comes to being a grandmother. And that's what I want to discuss here today. Let's begin in 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I believe that we have done in our society a rather poor job of the understanding of what parenting, what in this case being a mom, is all about. And let me explain to you in a simple verse what being a parent, not even just a mom, but a father, not just a father, but a grandfather and a grandmother, and perhaps even a great-grandfather or a great-grandmother. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you. Now keep in mind, this is Timothy. This is Paul writing to another minister, minister writing to minister, which first dwelt within you, or I'm sorry, which first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And I am sure that it is in you as well. This verse, I could stop here and we could be done for the day. And we could be done for the day. I'm not going to. I've got, you know, 30, 40, 30, 40 minutes. I'm going to talk for 30 or 40 minutes. Um, but nonetheless, this verse in and of itself shows us what... Timothy's mother and what Timothy's grandmother were all about in their upbringing of their son slash grandson. They had a sincere faith. And therefore, because of their teaching, because of their upbringing, Timothy had a sincere faith. Nowhere in the scriptures, and we're going to turn to some other passages, you can go ahead and turn there, to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, it mentions Timothy here for the first time in Scripture in Acts chapter 16. And beginning in verse 1. And he came also to Derbe and to Lystra, talking about Paul here. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Now keep in mind here, well, what's the difference between a Jew and a Greek? Well, what it's saying is, is his mom was the believer. His mom is, one, is the one who held to the principles of Christ. His mother had grown up Jewish and had obviously been converted to the faith. However, his father, being a Greek, wasn't a believer, right? It's comparing and contrasting the two. His mother was a believer. His father wasn't. And he was well spoken of, verse 2, by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, I'm not going to focus on verse, verse 3, but I just want to talk about verse 3 for a second. You want to talk about a devoted young man to the faith, because he's willing to be circumcised, not because he has to for the faith. We know that in Christianity today, you don't have to be circumcised in order to come to the faith. But for the stance of before the Jews, in order to meet them where they needed to be met, Timothy was will literally willing, he had such a sincere faith to say, sure, I'll be circumcised. There aren't many people that I know of that would come to the faith and say, sure, I'll take part in that. But that's Timothy. Where did he get this? It wasn't from the preacher. 
It wasn't from the elders at Derby and Lystra. It wasn't the deacons. It wasn't anybody in the church. And Timothy seems to have grown up, at least to some portion. We don't know exactly how old Timothy is at this time. We know that he's a young man. Well, a young man could mean anywhere from 15. It could mean 25. Right? He may have been 13 years old for all that we know. Whatever the case was, however old Timothy was, however long his, mo his mother and grandmother had been a believer, they are the ones that instilled Timothy with that sincere, upright faith, even to the point of saying, sure, I'll go with you, Paul, across the world to preach a gospel. Sure, I'll be circumcised on behalf so that I can reach people. You want to talk about a mature young man in the faith. And it was all due not to the support of the church, although the church did support him, but the support of his mother and his grandmother. You want to talk about a powerful story, and again, I could quit there. <laughs> That's all you need to know. I want to talk to you, though, about the influence that you have today as a mother and as a grandmother on imparting the faith to the next generations. Now, our world has turned topsy-turvy on itself, and all that we usually hear preached is, well, I sure don't have much influence as a parent on my children anymore. Well, I believe that we've done that to ourselves. Don't get me wrong. They were believers, sincere believers, sincere faith through Lois and through Eunice. But one of the things that they imparted to Timothy was not just the base level of faith. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But they talked about, and get this, regardless of an unbelieving father, in the household, a Greek man who didn't want anything to do with the faith, apparently. His mother and his grandmother passed on their faith. And that was the most important thing that they could pass on. Get this, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Beginning in verse 10. But you, Paul speaking to Timothy here, but you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That didn't turn Timothy away. Paul comes to Timothy at, at Lystra, at Derby, there in Acts chapter 16, and Timothy says, yeah, sure, I'll sign up for that. <laughs> right? Sure, I'll go with you, Timothy, or Paul. Sure, sure, I'll go help you start churches. Sure, I'll go be a faithful minister at churches. And Paul's saying, yeah, this journey's going to be fun. You're going to have to love. You're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to be understanding. You're going to have to have good conduct. You're going to have to persevere. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be beat. You're going to be shipwrecked. You're going to experience all of these things. Some of them Paul had experienced. Some of them had an experience. By the time that he wrote 2 Timothy, Paul had experienced all those things already. He's in prison during this writing. And he's saying, Timothy, you've put up with it this far. Keep fighting for it. Verse 13, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Who taught Timothy the scriptures, even from a young age? It wasn't anybody else in the church. It was his mother and his grandmother. You want... A next faithful generation, and again, this not only applies to moms, this applies to dads too. The only one who's going to get your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren to live faithfully is you. It will not, not be the preacher. Because no matter what I instill in people, 
no matter how much I spend time with the next generation, you're going to see them a lot more than I ever will or anybody else ever will as a grandparent or as a parent. Why was this so imperative, though, for Lois and Eunice that they wanted to live on the faith? This is point two. It lived in them. Timothy had a sincere faith. Why? Because his mother and his grandmother had a sincere faith. They were concerned about the things of God. Well, what does being concerned about the things of God mean? Well, it means that you're going to tell the next generation about the things concerning God. You are naturally going to tell them and equip them for the world, not just physically, physically as well, but spiritually. You're going to prepare them for the word of God and taking it out into the real world and the understanding of it. The first question that I have to ask to you moms and grandmas, and again, this applies to dads as well, do you have a sincere faith? Because if you're not passing it on to the generations, to the next ones, I would argue if it's sincere or not. Sincere faith means you care about the next generation's salvation. And insincere faith, you can tell where there's an insincere faith because they don't care about the next spiritual generation. They're just leaving them alone to figure it out for themselves. We'll talk about that as well. We've been talking about, and Brother Charlie mentioned it this morning, spiritually minded parenting. What are you passing on to the next generations? What are you passing on? Are you giving them that sincere faith? There's an issue if we're not. Check this out. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, there has just been this new age of, I'll call it churchianity, this new age of the understanding that we come to church to learn. And we come to church to learn, in fact, so much that, well, I shouldn't have to talk about it very much when we get back home. <laughs> right? There should be an understanding. Now, we don't say that out loud, but it's what we do. Right? Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now, does that sound familiar? Right? Greatest commandment. Christ says in the New Testament. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and on your gates. And then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, and houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. And you shall eat and be satisfied. Then watch yourself lest you forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. What was God's first priority for parenting? You teach them the things of God. Why? Because when you get into that new land, this was the principle for the Israelite people, and it's the principle that applies to us today. If you prepare them spiritually, physically they'll be taken care of later on. Physically, they'll get it. But if you don't prepare them spiritually, we don't have time for it, but go read through the book of Deuteronomy and the curses that God brought upon his people and did, in fact, again, bring them upon his people. Why? Because the people stopped writing it upon their doorposts and their gates. They didn't talk about it in their houses when they got up and when they went to bed. They didn't talk to the next generations about it. They just expected them to get it, right? Well, we, we go to synagogue every week. We listen to Moses every other day. Aren't they supposed to get it there? The next generations didn't. For all of human history, and we could look through all of Scripture to see this, the generations that didn't spend time, the parents, the grandparents, that didn't spend time telling the next generations about the faith, you know what happened to those next generations? They weren't faithful. They just weren't, right? Moses' generation is one of the only exceptions to that. And do you know how God got through to the kids? By the time that Moses died and Joshua took over, the people were faithful. But for 40 years, they hadn't been. 
What, would, what had to change in order for that next generation to be faithful? God had to kill them all off and show his power by wiping out generations in order to prove to the next one that I am God. And then you know what happened for the next generation after that one? They also became unfaithful. Because <laughs> they didn't tell their kids about it. And they didn't tell their grandkids about it. And everybody left the faith, for the most part. few exceptions to that. But you have a responsibility as a parent, as a mom, as a grandmother, as a great-grandmother, to pass on your faith. I can't impart a sincere faith to every single one of your children. I don't have enough time in the world. The elders don't have enough time in the world. I know that you, th I know that you say, and I say this too, well, I'm busy. What was the most important thing that these people do for the next generation? Here's what I hear a lot in the church, and I've heard this time and again, and every time I hear it, it makes my skin crawl. No joke, this is what we say. I want them to figure it out for themselves. Have you seen the way our world is? I don't want my sons to figure it out for themselves. I don't. Because if they try to figure it out for themselves, they'll go to bad sources to figure it out. Everybody does. I would too. <laughs> or B, this is what we say. I don't want to push them too hard. I might push them away. No, push them. I, I heard this uh, illustration a few weeks ago, and I was like, man, this guy. I mean, what, and I can't even remember who said it, but I was like, this guy's a genius. For all of you who have had, who have had children or, or you at one point in time have grown up, whatever the case was, you played sports, you did a craft, whatever the case was. What kept you and made you get better at whatever you were doing? It was somebody who was pushing you to do it. The kids who don't get pushed in a direction to get better at something, they usually quit. Because there's no encouragement and no source. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes the coach balls you out on the field. But as much as the coach balls you out on the field is as much as where he's sitting back on the sidelines teaching them to get better. And again, that doesn't just apply to sports. That applies to every single thing that you do in life. Everything. That's why I'm up here preaching to you and trying to encourage you. You know, let's do better at some things, right? There are things that we can improve on. And the reason I do that is because I'm here to encourage you and to push you to do it. If you didn't have anybody up here telling you that, and we just came in every Sunday, and, you yeah, know, nice to see you again, we'd all sit around on a, like a lump on the log. That's the idea of encouragement and push. But also this. We push the next generations to go to school, to brush their teeth, to take their bath, to behave. I have to tell my kids that a lot right now. Behave. And then two seconds later, they're misbehaving again. We push them to go to college. We push them to learn a trade. We push them in all the physical things. But when it comes to the faith, we say, well, I don't want to push them. I want them to figure it out for themselves. That is not what God asked us to do. That's not what he asked us to do. When the next generation wasn't told about the faith, and they said, well, I just kind of want them to go see it for themselves, they fell away. The entirety of next generations fell away. And we see that happen over and over, not only in scripture, in history. We see nations crumble because they weren't willing to tell the next generation about the faith. They weren't willing to get up in the morning and tell them about it, and go to bed at night and tell them about it. When you sit down to eat, talk to them about it. Put it on your doorposts, put it on your gates as reminders. Titus chapter 2. This is one of the other uh, evangelist epistles, right? Titus is a minister, and Paul here is relating to him how he should teach again. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. This, I preached this in my very first sermon that I ever preached for you guys. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, 
not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be dishonored. We tend to get this idea about next generations that they just pick up on things naturally, right? That they should just know naturally, and again, I'll use what Paul uses here, that they should know naturally how to, how to love their husbands. When I got married, when I became a husband, you know how much I knew about being a husband? Not nearly enough, and I still don't, by the way. Right? And when we had our boys, Everett and Miles, do you know how much I knew about being a parent? And again, I still don't know enough. Those things are things that have to be, and it doesn't have to happen in all, all in one day, but taught. Right? They're taught. You don't just naturally come by that knowledge. I believe one of the reasons why we've had such dilemmas in the family that we have here in America, seriously, do you, do we, do you agree with me on this church? Do you see what Satan has directly attacked in the last 50, 60, 70 years because he knew how effective it would be? It would be the family dynamic. It would be the family. And he attacked the family because he knew that is at the core of the faith. You get mothers not to tell their daughters about the faith, and you get fathers not to tell their sons about the faith, and grandmothers not to mention the faith, guess what happens? And when you tear families apart with divorce, that's what happens. And when you tear families apart with all kinds of crazy, as we have, that's what happens. Generations don't get an opportunity to be taught the faith, and now we see the result. Right? And the worst of it hadn't even come yet. But we see the result of it. This has to be priority number one. And again, Paul here uh, directly addresses well, older ladies, moms, grandmas. We have to teach the next generations how to be faithful, how to be loving wives, how to love children, how to be good workers, how to be sensible, how to be pure. You don't come by those things naturally, and we've taught for a long time. Well, you're just going to come by those naturally. You'll figure out the parenting thing. Well, there are a lot of messed up kids, so apparently... People didn't figure out the parenting thing. A lot of messed up families, apparently, they didn't figure it out. You don't come by the works of God, by the things of the commandments of God, without them being taught. And I promise, even me here preaching to you for 30 minutes in a morning, you're still not going to come by much. I was talking to a preacher the other day, and, uh, and he's a little bit older, and he said, one of my goals is to preach through all the scriptures. I want to preach through the whole Bible. And I went, I, I, and again, that's not a bad goal. I think that's a good goal. But there's no way that I can ever do that in my lifetime. There's no way. Do we know how many verses there are <laughs> in the scriptures? And do you know how many sermons I can get out of one verse? There's no way I'll ever get through it all. That's why it's going to have to be on you to study it and to learn it and to teach it to others. Because I just don't have enough time in the world. I'm learning it <laughs> all at the same time. There's just not enough time in the day. Well, here's the reality of it then. We have to be people that are concerned and putting forth what is most important first. What is most important first. Fifthly, legacy. Turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 1 again. Just, few, just a book over. I'm going to read verse 5 again. For I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. I can't tell you directly how Eunice and Lois did that. How did Timothy's mom... Eunice, what was her daily schedule for teaching Timothy the faith and getting him dressed and helping him brush his teeth? I, I, I have no idea. What was Lois, right? What, I assume that Eunice and Lois spent a lot of time together, mom and, and mother and grandmother. I assume that they were always around. Obviously, there was enough influence from the grandmother to be able to teach and help Timothy out as well with that, whatever the case might be. 
I can't tell you the routine. I can't tell you what they went through. All I can tell you is they spent the time nurturing the faith of their son and grandson because they made it the number one priority in his life. They made it the number one priority in his life. Let me ask you a question. What will your legacy be with your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids? Doesn't that hurt? <laughs> right? Some of you are great-grandparents, maybe even great-great-grandparents. Right? And you've seen what your children have become, what your grandchildren are becoming or have become, and what your great-great-grandchildren are becoming. Right? You're experiencing those, thing, those things firsthand. What was your legacy with them? What are they doing in their lives? What are they? Are they part of the faith? Are they not? Are they giving their lives over to Christ in submission to him? Are they not? Now, I'm not saying there's a guarantee that if you're a faithful parent that you'll have faithful children. That's not always the case. But we do see what it talks about in Scripture when it says that you're an unfaithful parent <laughs> and that you don't make priority in their lives. Number one, teaching them the faith, imparting it to them. And keep in mind here, this was with an unfaithful parent dad in the home and they did it they may have even tag teamed it mom and grandma coming together I can tell you there's nothing more powerful a force on this earth than a mother and a grandmother coming together I firsthand experienced that right if you want to get supper done on time call grandma or call mom one of the two and they'll tag team it, and they will get it done. The fastest working team that I've ever seen. You remember back in the Acts chapter, you don't have to turn there, Acts chapter 16, verse 2. Do you remember what the saints said about Timothy at Lystra and at Derby? It says that he was spoken well of. Who doesn't want their kid to be spoken well of? I mean, what an honor for a parent. Your child is spoken well of. Right, you go to the school meeting, wherever it might be, and you get, you get there and you go, and the teacher says, wow, what a, you know, what a good kid. Right? I mean, isn't that just, I mean, it melts everything else away. That's what the church was saying about Timothy. What an honor. What prestige. And they elected everybody else out of the church in Lystra and Derby. You know, Paul, who you should take? Timothy. I mean, that's how faithful Timothy was. And he got it from his mother and his grandmother. I have had someone directly impact my life with my faith. And that would be my mother. One of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing is because of my mother. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned the story. If you have heard this, you're going to hear it about a thousand more times because I always bring it back up. When I was about 15, um, and I, you know, I wasn't a... I wasn't horribly ungodly or anything like that, but I wasn't living how I should have been living in Christ by any means. And when I was 15, I was attending church, you know, trying to live faithfully, a lot of peer pressure, a lot of things of the world came in. And um, when I was 15, I remember my mother asking me, you know, Jacob, because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't know what career. I had no goals whatsoever <laughs> for myself. You know, if I did anything, it was out of, you know, enjoyment. I, I, I just didn't have any goals to push forward for, whatever the case was. And my mother came to me and she said, you know, Jacob, you could be a preacher. And you know what I told her? No. <laughs> Nobody likes them, was my number one reason, which isn't wrong. You're probably not going to like me after this sermon, that's all right. And number two, they don't make enough money, was my number two reason. And by the way, both of those are true. <laughs> right? They're not entirely wrong. But she sat there and kept asking me that. Not daily. Not weekly. Not even monthly. A few times a year. She would push me. You know, you can always become a minister. You can always push towards that. And always in the back of my mind, I knew that. You know, one of these days I can set aside for ministry. And now I'm doing it. It was simple, 
It was subtle, but it was to the point. She wanted to make sure that I was living faithfully. And she knew one of the ways that I could do that was, hey, you could become a minister. Right? You envelop yourself in the word. You envelop yourself in the understanding of scripture. And now I get to do that for a living. Yes. Lois and Eunice had a part in the kingdom of God. Do you know how many souls Lois and Eunice saved? Not because they talked to anybody directly, but because they taught their son the faith. I don't know if Timothy went around telling the story of Lois and Eunice, but every, you know, every time that, a, that a, a soul was brought up out of baptism, right, out of the baptismal waters, and we said, hallelujah, child of God, right? I don't know if Timothy got up there and said this, you know, but he said, thank you to my mother and my grandmother because they taught me this stuff. I don't know if he thought of them. You know, I don't know how often he sent a, he sent a letter to them, didn't have a phone call, right, didn't have FaceTime, so he had to write the letters to them. But I'm sure it ran through his mind, and here is Paul reminding him of them. Paul is even saying thank you for Lois and for Eunice, two faithful ladies, for imparting the faith to their son. Don't underestimate your impact on your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, moms and grandmas. Don't underestimate your impact. You have the greatest impact on your children, more than I do, more than anybody else does in this church. If you have a relationship, and I pray and I hope that you do, with your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren, please impart the faith to them. You don't have to ram it down their throat to talk to them about it. You don't have to read a thousand scriptures a day to them. Start with one. But you have the greatest impact possible. Satan has been attacking the churches. Don't get me wrong. He has been attacking doctrine, truth. He has been attacking that. But for a lot longer time, before, even when the churches were at a height in America, what did he start attacking? The family dynamic. Because he's known for thousands of years. Satan's smart. He's a good schemer. He's known for thousands of years. I know what will tear down this civilization that is so holy and righteous. And I'll hit the family to do it. And it was subtle. And we missed it. And now, frankly, the country's in shambles because of it. And it's because we haven't impacted the next generations with the faith like we should have been. We taught them everything, including how to use channel locks, sometimes, right? We taught them everything except how to be faithful, which was the most important of all. Didn't, hasn't Satan flipped the script? He totally made that the lowest priority. I, 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 honestly, I, I can't. Kingdom Kids is amazing. Sunday School for Kids is absolutely amazing. Absolutely wonderful. I love it. But at tops, that's an hour and a half in the week. Well, they're going to school. They're going to college. They're going off into the world. And they're getting a lot of Satan way more than they're getting God for that hour and a half in the week. They're hearing Satan a lot more than they're hearing God. An hour and a half's great on Sunday. I, I like that. I learned tons in Sunday school, and I learned tons in children's church. I learned a lot of the faith in there. But where I learned to live it was from my mother. Where I learned to be concerned about the things of God was from my mother. Where I learned what it meant to live faithfully, even when you mess up, even when you sin, but turn back to God in humility, that was from my Mother. Now you're going to ask me, how do I impact my children or my grandchildren with the faith? Great question. <laughs> Great question. I would start with Deuteronomy chapter 6. Just talk to them about it. Right? I, I, I know that those are sometimes awkward conversations, and they're sometimes hard to delineate. So the biggest question that, 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 you'll, that you'll think of, that I get a lot of the time, is, well, where do I start? Well, there are 
66 books. Just start. Pick one, study it, and teach it to them. Right? It doesn't have to be 52 verses in a day. Try one verse a day. Start small. Right? But don't underestimate your impact and don't think that it's too late to start. It is not too late to start. We can make a difference as parents. And this applies to me as well. As parents, we can make a difference. But we have to be willing to take those steps. Don't leave it to chance. Please, don't leave it to chance. Because when you do, it's already too late. They're going to learn something. You'll get amazingly blessed if they remain in the faith. But the vast majority just don't. They just don't. As we stand and sing our hymn invitation today, and as we reflect upon spiritually minded parenting. Now, ladies, don't you be concerned. Next month is Father's Day. I'll be banging on myself as much as I'll be banging on anybody else next month. But know how crucial it is, imperative it is that I get up here and I teach and that you go home and you teach. That I get up here and I preach my sermon for 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and you listen to the Word of God. That's amazing. I'm so glad that you were here this morning to hear the Word of God. But I also want you to be concerned about what you do when you get home. And if you need reminders, write it on your doorposts. Write it on your gates. Put it on your car door, right? Teach them the faith. Church, we serve an amazing and awesome God, and he's too great not to talk about. That's why I do what I do, because I know that he's too great not to talk about. I want you to talk about him as well. If you have a decision to make this morning to come to that amazing, awesome faith of the God that we serve that saves lives. That, is that Deuteronomy chapter 6 passage not amazing? Seriously, he says, if you will teach the faith, show your children and your grandchildren the faith. If you will give that to them, I'll send them into the land and I'll make it amazing for them. I will bless them beyond measure. They called it a land of milk and honey in Canaan because that's what it was. A land overflowing with blessings. And the generation that got to go there was the faithful one. They got blessed physically because spiritually they got it. And that's what we're searching for. I hope and I pray that you do that today. That you will seek God not just for the physical, but you will seek to serve him diligently. That you will put him first in the things that you do. And that you will owe him, and we already do, Owe him all the praise and worship that we can. Let's stand and sing your hymn.